Welcome to the documentary from the BBC World Service, where we report the world, however difficult the issue, however hard to reach. Podcasts from the BBC World Service are supported by advertising. And what about if I fancied taking my chances for a swim? How deep is that? You get shot. We're looking out over the edge of a steep, tree-lined hill. Beneath me are loads of bushes, in every shade of green and orange and yellow, and a motorway cuts through the view. Beyond is a snaking, winding grey river. On the other side of the river, there's a ridge of mountains, but very few bushes or trees. It seems bare, just big patches of grass. There are no signs of motorways. In the distance, there are a few small buildings in bright white. I've been told they're only for show. No one actually lives there, and they're only used by military watchmen. Their um, guard posts are underground, a lot of them. You see, on the other side of that river is North Korea. We've all heard about that country in the news. North Korea is at it again with a new test at an old missile site. Glimpses into North Korean life are rare. Journalists aren't allowed to operate freely there. But recently, there's been a new window into the lives of ordinary people living on the other side of that river. It's on South Korean TV screens and on YouTube. 안녕하세요, 연통 TV 구독자 여러분, 강나라입니다. 사실 제가 요즘 들어 야만의 North Korean defectors have become social media stars, and some of them appear on a hugely popular TV show. North Korea is not Kim Jong Un. North Korea is not nuclear. But many struggle to adjust to life in the South. I'm Jonathan Griffin. And I'm Natalia Zuo. And in this program, we're meeting North Korea's celebrity defectors. My happiest memory in North Korea was going to the beach for holiday or having my entire family sitting down enjoying a meal. Kang Nara is a 21-year-old North Korean woman. She's thin with an angular face, pale complexion and long dyed brown hair. Her family was once the elite of North Korean society, but when she was a child, her mum left her upper middle class home in North Korea and never returned. When I was 10 years old, my mother went to China and then came to South Korea. My mum sent a broker to bring me to South Korea. When I was in North Korea, I never thought about coming to South Korea. I was comfortable because I had everything I wanted. But when I thought about it, there was no freedom there. That's why my mother and I came to South Korea. Nara now lives with her mom in a tiny apartment in Seoul with dozens of small, colorful fish. My dad and my brother are still in North Korea. But they don't want to come here. There's nothing I can do. It's their choice. So look, in this program we're going to focus on a crucial part of our understanding of North Korea. Much of what we learn about the secretive state comes from defectors, people who flee the country for a new life elsewhere. Over 30,000 of them live in South Korea. Some of them struggle to adapt to the capitalist society after years of living under communist rule. But some become celebrities. Today, you'll hear from both. Now, there are two ways to get into South Korea for defectors. The first is to go south, over the dangerous demilitarized zone that runs between the two nations, where the chances of death are high. We'll come to that one later. But the other, more common route, is to go north and head up across a river into China. Then you go west, then down into Thailand or Vietnam, and then to South Korea. My mom went to China first and wanted to bring the whole family out. When my mom was in China, there was nothing I longed for apart from my mom because my dad was able to provide me with a good life. Now, the Chinese government are one of North Korea's few relatively close allies, so China won't house North Korean defectors. If a defector gets caught in China, they're sent back to North Korea where, according to South Korean NGOs, they face forced labour, physical abuse or even death. 
So in order to make a safe journey, North Koreans need brokers, like the one that Kang Nara mentioned. Brokers cost thousands of dollars, but they claim to know the safest routes, they can organise transportation, and they can get access to Chinese-style clothes to help North Koreans blend into their environment. Using brokers may reduce the defectors' risk of death, but there are plenty of other dangers on the route. I swam with a North Korean broker across the river. After you cross the river, you are in China. It's something I never want to think about or experience again. Even though there was a broker with me, I didn't know how to swim. The water was very fast and I lost hold of the broker's hand. I went down the river and got caught by a branch. I thought about my dying words and last wishes. I almost died. When she finally reached South Korean soil, Nara was taken to a training centre called Hanawon. It was here that she was reunited with her mom. At the age of 18, I saw my mother for the first time in eight years at the National Intelligence Service in South Korea. Nara stayed in the training centre for three months. In the training centre, North Koreans are taught all about South Korean society, from which English words are used in South Korea, to the practical details of how to live in a capitalist country. At the training centre, we learned how to use the banks and subways before going into the real society. The first time I used an ATM was incredible. We didn't have it in North Korea. You put in a plastic card and it gives you money. Because it took a few seconds for the money to come out, I would be like, oh my God, it just ate my money. I remember being worried about it. The South Korean government provides a grant to defectors like Nara to help them integrate into society. But the money often doesn't last long. Brokers typically expect thousands of dollars for facilitating the journey in the first place. And often North Korean defectors immediately want to send money back home to their loved ones via underground networks. In North Korea, Nara went to an art school and a university. But since coming to South Korea, she's turned her back on education. Instead, she's found herself drawn to a technology that wasn't available to her in the North, social media. I didn't know anything about social media, so I had to learn. When I first used Facebook, I had no idea how to use it. So I found myself replying to myself rather than posting things. Writing, this is such a nice place. It was only later that I realized I was talking to myself. But since then, Nara's skills have developed quite a lot. I make a living through appearing in broadcast and YouTube. What's become something of a trend, Nara has, well, like a number of North Koreans, managed to tap into a curious South Korean audience on social media. She now has 50,000 followers on her personal Instagram account, she's got a booming YouTube channel, and she regularly makes social media videos for Yonhot News, a South Korean news agency. We go along to watch her average day at work in a small studio in the centre of Seoul. <laughs> In front of the camera, Nara is animated and bombastic. She knows how to engage with a generation of people on their smartphones. For exactly four minutes, she talks without a script, straight down the lens of the camera, without hesitation. It's very impressive. But I begin to wonder what difference the success she's having in front of camera is having on her. Now she's got a profile, she's got fans to please. And she shows me a picture from before her life in South Korea before the social media. She looks like a different person. Yes, she has a chubby face, a severe bow haircut with black hair. There's no way I would recognise her today. During our time with her, she even goes to a pharmacy to buy laxatives, all with the intention of losing more weight to enhance her appearance. It's easy to look at Nara and see a young woman trying to make the best out of her new life. She gets up early every morning. She gets ready for a couple of hours and then works around the clock. But what impact is all of this having on her? 
she acknowledges that at the moment she doesn't have time for much of a life outside of work. I normally get to see my friends once every two weeks. Sometimes we go to karaoke or eat out. Very often we just chat because I don't see them a lot. Three and four hours pass really quickly. I don't have time to feel lonely. If I have some more time, I want to sleep. Adjusting to life in South Korea is a problem that many North Koreans face. Jacko Zwetsalu is the host of the North Korean News podcast. He's a total boffin on all things North Korea related. He told me about the difficulties North Koreans face when they arrive. It's really difficult. If you're from North Korea and you've been trained or educated for a particular job, maybe an engineer or a doctor, you'll come here and find that, technically speaking, you're decades behind your peers in South Korea. So a doctor here will have a lot more modern training and access to modern equipment and machinery. The North Korean doctor will not. And that's really hard for them. So most doctors, engineers, anyone with a, with a highly educated job who comes here will find they cannot, without retraining, go into the same industry here. But Jacko also says there are assumptions that make it difficult for defectors to adjust. Because I think in South Korea there's an expectation among many people that, look, we're all just the same, we North Koreans and South Koreans, so surely all it will take is you know, the snap of a finger. It's almost like some people have likened it to the Sleeping Beauty myth, that North Koreans are like Sleeping Beauty, and all it takes is the single kiss from Prince Charming to wake them up and the, the a prince and princess will get married and they'll live happily ever after and everyone will be exactly the same, speaking the same Korean, with the same cultural knowledge, the same cultural expectations, the same work uh, atmosphere, all these things. And, and uh, North Koreans find very quickly that that's not the case here and that South Koreans are not willing to or, or not able to sort of open their minds and accept that yeah, they look like us but you know, North Koreans have come through a different set of experiences for the last 70 years and, and we have to expect, accept that. So I think South Koreans accept North, expect North Koreans to just be like us overnight. Just, you know, hurry up. Be normal. And that's really hard. While Kal Nara is making her own path on social media, on the other side of Seoul, in an area called Marpo Gu, we met another defector taking a different route. She's called Yu Hunju. In North Korea, I can't wear colourful clothes or people would think that I'm crazy. Bright colours don't fit into that atmosphere. We've been educated since we are young that Kim Jong-un is humble and bright colours don't equal humbleness. One of the things I love about being here is that as long as you can afford it, you can wear anything. It's early in the morning and 42-year-old Hyun Ju has a long day ahead of her. She wears a scarlet dress, six-inch black heels, red lipstick and thick makeup. Her face is partly obscured by a sizable fringe, but underneath that, she looks tired. In a few moments, she will appear on Now On My Way To Meet You, a popular show on South Korea's Channel A. It's been on South Korean TV for nine years now, with over 420 episodes in that time. The show itself is crazy. 13 North Korean defectors sit on chairs in the centre of a set designed to look like a North Korean marketplace. And surrounded by this backdrop of barbers, market stalls and restaurants, they take it in turns to tell stories about their lives back home. Occasionally, this material is then interspersed with elements more traditionally seen in a talent show, like music performances and dancing. Filming is a marathon. That was boring. We sat and watched them film two shows in a day, and recording the footage takes hours and hours and hours. It must be exhausting for the defectors set on stage. Not only are they set up right, with a camera trained on each of them, trying to relive traumatic experiences. But when they are not speaking, they are receiving messages from producers leaning on the floor with whiteboards telling them to interject or tell certain anecdotes. The whole time the defectors are in front of a camera, whether they're talking or not, their expressions are being scrutinised, with the ones that make the best television cut into the show. The result is that they sit poised to interject at all times with looks of shock and awe and horror. There's a high turnover of defectors who appear on the show, 
but Hun Ju has kept her place since the start. One of the producers on the show is Sun Q Lee. He told us why she has lasted so long. Yu Hyunju is symbolic of the program. She and the program are inseparable. She's very talented. She plays the accordion well and she sings well. She tells the stories we need in an interesting way. And when other people tell their stories, she listens with empathy and sympathy. At one point during the filming, Hyun Ju bursts into floods of tears. And so do a number of other female defectors around her. Filming stops, and she goes back to the dressing room to reapply her makeup, and we follow her in. In the dressing room, Hyun Ju explains to us that she was personally affected by a testimony of separation that she heard from one of the other defectors. Look, tears are common during filming of the program. Going back to previous episodes of Now on My Way to Meet You, you often see defectors, and particularly Hyun Ju, crying as they recount life back home. But it's not all tears. There are moments of humour too. Often this comes from dramatic sound effects or emojis plastered across the screen. Sometimes the head of the person speaking is even photoshopped in crazy ways. For instance, to look as though it's expanding. And at one point during filming, the show's host calls for my attention. (laughs) Suddenly, I'm part of the show as he strokes my red beard, much to the hilarity of the defectors. Now, this is a side issue, I know, but I only saw two people with facial hair in the whole of South Korea. Frankly, it's not very popular there. At the end of the filming, I caught up with the clean-shaven presenter, Nam Hee Suk, and asked him what the role of humour is in telling the defectors' stories. Every time there's North Korean news, it's all about Kim Jong-un or missiles. But this program is talking about the people who live everyday lives in North Korea. There are many North Korean defectors living in South Korea. None of them used to say they are from the North, but thanks to the success of our program, North Korean defectors can now say they are North Korean. The lives of defectors are full of pain. One of the important things is to make the pain lighter. But at the same time, we have to be careful not making it too light. Unlike news on the BBC, we want to make a different program, which mixes news with humor. His success, the purpose of Now On My Way To Meet You, is to show that North Koreans are, quote, just like us. And maybe they are. But it's also important to know that defectors and the programs on which they appear usually only represent a certain demographic of North Korean society. Society is highly fragmented by a class system in North Korea. Class and opportunity are all linked to your family's supposed loyalty towards the regime. So if your family has traditionally been supporters of the Kim family, or if they fought foreigners for North Korea, you can enter the elite, or what is described as the comfortable upper middle class, where you earn a decent wage and you have access to technology. The elites often live in Pyongyang. Then come the peasants, the labourers and the workers who form the next class down. These are the majority and are not permitted to live in the capital. They often find themselves out in the farmland, where electricity is scarce. But if your family had opposed the Elder Kim's regime, or if you'd previously worked with South Korea or Japan, then you find yourself on the lowest rung of the ladder, out in the sticks. This class system affects every part of day-to-day life, from residence to employment, from education to diet. Because of the fees that brokers charge to aid defection, The prospect of defecting is not something that may feel tangible to those on lower incomes. The US Central Intelligence Agency and a variety of other organisations claim the average yearly wage is somewhere between $1,000 to $2,000 for North Korean non-elites. The fee for a broker to help you defect via China typically costs over $8,000. So for many working-class people, the numbers are unthinkable. Many of the defectors we speak to are therefore from the upper crust 
of North Korean society. Oh, my name is Kim Hyuk Kim. My like grandfather was really loyal to the regime, and my grand grandfather fought against、uh, Japan with Kim Il Sung. That's why my family was from elite class, and I I could become one of elite family. Twenty-nine-year-old Kim Hyuk Kim left North Korea when he was nineteen, initially to study in China. While he was at university, one of his roommates showed him how to use Google. This was at a point when it was far easier to do this sort of thing in mainland China. I googled about Kim Jong Il first because I'm so curious about who is Kim Jong Il, and then I found that Wikipedia, and then I asked my friends, "Is it real?" And then they said, "Yes, it is real." And they were so shocked. How how could you do that to your people? You always teach me you are the great leader. You are the greatest leader in the world. And where is the greatest leader in the world now? You are not. You are a liar. After that, Kim Hyuk left North Korea, but his family still remains there to this day. I just guess something happened to my family, and they were in very big trouble because of me. Because I betrayed the government in their perspective. So my family is not the elite family anymore. Now, my family was well off in North Korea, and then, like, how could they live well in North Korea? Because they are standing under people's blood or people's like tears. Kim Hyuk is now a contributor to the TV show Now on My Way to Meet You. I had to let North Korean elite know you are wrong. Please open your eyes. In other countries like China or Singapore, there are still like 500 or 600 North Korean elites are living in there, and they can access the internet and they can watch this program. I can help them to change their perspective. Kim Hyuk says he's on the program to reach students abroad and North Korean diplomats with his message, but he also has this advice for his fellow panelists. This is basically entertainment show, or they don't need to act in this program. But one thing is very important. We don't need to tell a lie to like make people more like emotional. Still to come, we meet a high-profile defector who says he wants no part of the reality TV talk show circuit anymore. A cat and a dog getting a scrap on the Korean border. Yu Hongju and, to a lesser extent, Jonathan, perform for a room of tomato farmers. And we meet the. F- <laughs> oh no! Not you. Look, would you shut up? We're heading towards the Korean border, and there's a war run. As you can hear, there's a dog going nuts, a cat that won't stop purring, and one well normal dog that seems pretty chilled while listening to the other two carry on. Anyway, we're not here to meet them. We're here to meet a group of retirees at a local community hall. It's here that they while away their days playing board games and watching TV. We take our shoes off, and over some pigs' trotters, we play them. Now on my way to meet you, just one of the crop of South Korean reality TV shows. Focusing on the testimonies of North Korean defectors, we want to see how pensioners, who felt the ramifications of a divided Korea firsthand, feel about the stories they hear coming from the north. We want to see how pensioners, who felt the ramifications of a divided Korea firsthand, feel about the stories they hear coming from the north. When we start to play the video, an icy silence engulfs the room. But when it's over, one of the elderly men sat next to us. Starts to explain how he feels. Every time when I watch one of these shows, I cry. These TV shows get out your emotions. Reality TV is a really popular medium for South Koreans to digest stories from North Korean defectors. But what do the North Korean defectors who take part get out of the experience? 
Well, the first thing is money. Due to technology lagging behind in North Korea and cultural differences, it can be really difficult for defectors to find well-paid job opportunities. Reality TV pays comparatively well for a couple of jammed, packed days worth of filming, and still allows them to pursue other jobs on the side. But there are pressures that come with appearing on the TV shows too. Defectors will only find regular work on TV if they create interesting, engaging content. But if their stories fail to land a punch with audiences, they may lose their place to a fresher defector. It's important to remember that these shows aren't public service broadcasting. They're a hybrid of current affairs and entertainment. Perhaps unsurprisingly, North Korea have accused the shows of being part of a smear campaign against the North. So, is there any truth in that? Professor Kang Myung Do was a prominent face on programs like Now on My Way to Meet You for two and a half years. As a son-in-law of a former North Korean prime minister, he was gripping viewing for many South Koreans. But Myung Do claims, after a while, a friction developed between himself and the production teams he worked with, so he stepped back from reality TV. He now runs his own restaurant, specializing in North Korean food and employing North Korean defectors. Over some sizzling meat, crisp cabbage, and、uh, interesting ice cold noodle soup, Myung Do told me why he felt compromised by appearing on reality TV. Ah, 그렇죠. 그러니까 entertainment programs like、uh, Now on My Way to Meet You need good ratings, so stories tend to be exaggerated. And the program gets criticized for that. South Koreans don't know whether the stories are true, but 33,000 North Korean defectors know. Exaggerations are inevitable when shows like this run for such a long time and ratings go down. Despite acknowledging that stories from these shows are typically exaggerated, Myung Do says that the programs perform a positive function. He suggests their presence is 80% useful to society and 20% unhelpful, arguing that they provide a window for South Koreans to learn about North Korean people. Myung Do was a popular figure on the program. His background in the North Korean military gave him a unique outlook on some of the issues raised. But at times, he says, his expertise was overlooked in favor of exaggerations. There are important facts at stake. I know a lot about the North Korean military, the regime, the soldiers. I know what really goes on behind the scenes. I was in a position on a show where I would be on with 12 North Korean panelists. I would know who is exaggerating. There were a few times when I didn't say a thing because it is an entertainment show. I was on it for two and a half years. And there were frictions between the producers and me. I don't want to be seen as a liar if unification happens. That's why I quit the program. Sometimes I watch the show, but the exaggerations are getting bigger. As the program lasts longer, the stories are becoming more exaggerated to keep the ratings. We put the claims to Channel A, which broadcasts now on my way to meet you. Sung Kyu Lee is a producer on the show. He told me about the process they use to verify the contents of the program. There's a vetting process. We do a lot of pre-interviews and we fact-check all stories before selecting them. For each episode, we film five to six hours. After that, we go through fact-checking. We can't just make a program based on personal stories. We have to check whether what the defectors are saying is true. So we check using news archives or YouTube sources. We pick out the stories we can fact check. There are situations where some people exaggerate stories or try to minimize stories. But there's a huge network of North Korean defectors in South Korea, and through it, you can check several times. If we don't think the stories make sense, we do double or triple checks and ask defectors to give us more context. When we can't verify a story, we take it out. So Channel A say they do their background checks and research the anecdotes that defectors provide on their show. 
But there have been inconsistencies in some of the tales defectors have told on the programme and given to other media. So, which stories should you believe? And how much faith should we put in defector testimonies overall? Here's Jacko's wet sleut, eagle-eyed watcher of all things North Korea and host of the North Korea News Podcast. There are some people in South Korea and outside Korea who try to poke holes in defector narratives and say, well, look, last time she said this, this time we said that. And I think that's not how human narratives work. They don't work to that level of, of, uh, of, of nth degree accuracy. But also what I think happens... And this is also a natural human phenomenon, whether it's intentional or, or probably more likely unconscious, is that if I'm one of a group of, of North Korean refugees who came south, and we've spent a lot of time together, a lot of months, and I've heard everybody's stories, but I'm the only one who later on ends up on television. I'm the only one with a voice, a public voice, a platform. I might tell other people's stories, and they might be elements of other people's stories might become. It's 7 p.m. on Friday night, and today we've left Seoul to head up to a village on the edge of the demilitarized zone. From here, you can just about see North Korean mountains. It's also home to a number of tomato farmers. There's even a big shrine to a giant tomato in a local square. We're here to see how Yu Hunju, the celebrity defector who often wears red, makes the rest of her income away from reality TV. It's hard to think of anywhere more removed from the glitz and glamour of Channel A, which had bright lights and cameras and producers, many of whom were in their 20s, buzzing around. It's a far cry from where we are currently. This place is quiet. We're in a village hall, which has 20 or so rows of empty fold-up chairs. Tonight, Yu Hunju and nine fellow defectors will sing, dance and play traditional North and South Korean songs to 200 or so elderly tomato farmers. The night starts off in surreal fashion. After playing the South Korean national anthem, we're treated to five speeches from local businessmen. Each one is greeted with rapturous applause. <laughs> Then it's time to get the main event underway. Hunju MCs and immediately delights the crowd with her blistering accordion playing. Then on come the dancing girls with big smiles on their faces as they dive into synchronised routines. I'm really feeling it, tapping my feet. But I look around and the crowd is smiling, but kind of passive. Maybe they've had a long day. Anyway, it's not long before I'm summoned on stage to dance. It's one of those moments where I have to pinch myself. What is going on here? I'm dancing with 10 North Korean defectors on the Korean border for the entertainment of a crowd of elderly South Korean tomato farmers. Fortunately, one of the event organisers was able to explain to me the purpose of what we were doing. I work for a non-governmental organization. I've been inviting defectors to perform at various locations for three to four years. As a result, in the future when there is reunification, these people will blend in better and the South Koreans will accept their differences. There's a lot of talk about unification here. but South Korea and North Korea talk up the idea of becoming one again. So how did we get into this mess in the first place? Well, let's go back to 1945, when two United States officials, no experts in Korea, by the way, were told to work out a US occupation zone in East Asia. They were worried the Soviets would occupy the entire Korean peninsula before them. So, within 30 minutes, they came up with a dividing line. The line cut Korea roughly in half, along the 38th parallel of latitude. 
keeping the largest city Seoul in their American section. The Soviet Union agreed to the dividing line. Despite the Korean War and advancements from both sides back and forth, ultimately, what those two men knocked up in 30 minutes became the line that changed history. It chopped Korea into two halves. One rushed towards communism, the other has since embraced capitalism. One invested heavily in the military, the other has pursued an economy based on technology. But subtle and complex cultural changes have also underpinned the division. Take Kang Nara, the North Korean with a huge following on social media, who now lives in South Korea. In some of her YouTube videos, she dresses up in North Korean military uniform to the delight of her fans. But will she ever be more than a North Korean to South Koreans? Will she always be othered? I want to continue working in this field. If not, I will have to find a part-time job working in an office. I'll be grateful to keep getting opportunities like this. I'll keep learning about North Korea because as time goes on, I will know less and less about the country. There are only so many things you can talk about to do with North Korea. I'm hoping, maybe 10 years down the line, to expand my role as a broadcaster, to discuss other issues other than just North Korea. It can't be easy to be Kang Nara. She may have over 122,000 followers on YouTube, but she's keenly aware that her mostly young male fan base watch her videos because they expect North Korean content. While she may want to explore other things, her most watched videos, the ones that get hundreds of thousands of views, all focus on North Korea. They have sensationalised, grabby titles like A North Korean defector talks about three shocking things about the National Intelligence Service. Or How North Korean government treats defectors from South Korea. There's even one called I am North Korean defector, would you hug me? where she stands in the centre of a busy pedestrian area, arms outstretched, with a blindfold on, waiting for affection. I asked Jack Ozuet Salute, the host of the NK News podcast, if there's a bigger problem here. Are North Koreans who appear on YouTube or South Korean TV always going to be typecast? Foreigners who live in Korea who speak Korean to a good degree, uh, when they come on TV, their purpose on TV is to be that foreigner who can speak in Korean about, for example, let's say the topic for today is how are elderly people taken care of, and then we'll get someone in from America who can speak Korean and say, right, now you tell us how exactly in America are all the elderly people taken care of, and now let's compare that to how it is in in South Korea. Similarly, in North Koreans, yes, their role is always to be the North Korean and to give that comparison story or to give that escape narrative or that story about falling in love in North Korea. It's very hard for a North Korean or a former North Korean in South Korea to break out of that and to become known for something just for being themselves you know, or you know, for being a talented singer or a great actor or a great storyteller or something. So, yeah, they, they do become typecast as that North Korean forever. And so there's a shelf life, I suppose, in that you know, once they've told all their stories, they don't come on TV that much anymore. And it's a bit like that with the, the Korean-speaking foreigners as well, that they're there to fulfil a role, a role that, that pleases the South Korean audience and not to get beyond that too much. So Kang Nara is just one of a number of North Korean defectors waiting for South Korean audiences to accept them as more than just their birthplace. But one of her fellow countrymen appears to have found a different path to happiness in South Korean society. Oh, is this him? Our translator once told me you can tell a North Korean defector by their upright posture. I'm not sure if that's true, but Kim Gang Yu in his early 20s, stands up taller and straighter than anyone I've ever seen before. 
Gang Yu graduated from high school at 17 and then went to work in the North Korean military. One of his roles was to stand on the border facing the Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ, a 250-kilometer long, 4-kilometer wide stretch of land that splits the neighboring countries. Stood on the edge of the North Korean side night after night, all he could see was South Korea staring back at him. And that's when he started to think about defecting. We took him back to stand on the other side of the DMZ, the Cold War's last frontier. When I lived in Pyongyang, I watched lots of South Korean dramas, but I never believed any of them. They could have been propaganda films. As I grew up, I questioned whether there was any truth to them. When I was in the military, I stood on the guard post and looked across the Korean border. I saw bright lights. I started to wonder if the South Korean economy was developed. I came to the conclusion that if they were not economically developed, there would not be those lights. Those lights were on my mind while I was scouring fields for herbs. If I went to South Korea, I wouldn't have to go hunting for wild herbs. I could be free. In the DMZ, you find landmines and barbed wire fences. While on duty, many soldiers lost their legs to the mines. I wondered if I would die trying to cross over to South Korea. In the electric fences, there are currents of 2,200 volts running through. But the electricity isn't running through all the time. It runs intermittently. No one can predict the timing. Sometimes you see wild boars who have been electrocuted and died. No matter how hungry you are, you are not able to eat the meat because the carcasses of the boars have been blackened and it smells too. It's dangerous. But despite the risk of death, I felt that I really wanted to go south because it may be paradise over there. It was my fourth year serving in the military. I was determined to go south, even if I were to die. So I went inside the DMZ. In order to evade the landmines, I walked along the riverside thinking that mines would not be buried in those parts. I ran throughout the night. It's only four kilometers between North and South Korea. By dawn in the morning, I managed to cross a fence. I ran as fast as I could. I didn't know whether electricity was running in the fence or if I would step on a landmine. I just ran. I was so exhausted it was difficult for me to climb the hill. When I tried to cross another fence, I hurt my face. There was blood. But 50 meters after the fence, there was a proper road. I thought, now I have survived. After walking for 10 minutes, I found a South Korean guard post. I notified the soldiers there that I had arrived, and they put the measures in place to receive my defection. I sat in their guard post taking a drink and talking to the South Korean soldiers. Then I was investigated. And that's how I came to South Korea. After defecting, Gang Yu was provided with opportunities on South Korean entertainment programmes to talk about his experiences. At first he did them, but he says he felt compromised by the stories he was expected to talk about on air. There is an element of earning your money too easily. That's why I was more cautious about doing them. Sometimes I had to exaggerate the truth. And that's why I wanted to scale down. For entertainment shows, you can't trick people. There are things that are common knowledge that you can't fact-check. If you are talking about something you have experienced and generalize as if that has happened throughout North Korea, someone may say, that didn't happen where I live. That stirs up controversy and raises questions of fabrication. I don't want to be misconstrued as a con man. I hated the fact that some people were generalizing things so much. For example, somebody talking about picking out a kernel of corn from a drain to eat. Maybe that is that person's experience. But it's not all of North Korea. Viewers could be misled because of that. Even when he was appearing on the defector programs, Gang Yu says he didn't use to watch them in his own time. Now he's stopped appearing on these shows and gone back into education. And he's also thrown himself headlong into one of South Korea's most popular passions, football. Yeah, he's football mad. He says he supports Tottenham, who of course have the famous South Korean player Song Hyun-min. Although he likes Barcelona, 
because he says Messi is, quote, like a god. And all of that time watching his idols on television hasn't been going to waste. The referee said, do not cuss. (laughs) (laughs) Gang Yu plays as a pacey forward for New Korea FC, a local amateur football team aiming to show the power of a unified Korea by incorporating players from both the North and the South. We go to watch them in a local tournament and the manager says that the importance of their teamwork transcends sport. They call it a reunification football match. There are a lot of defectors wishing for unification. Gang Yu plays football all morning, energetically buzzing around the pitch. His team even make it to the final of the cup. But when they get there, they run into some trouble. Number 90, Berlin United wins it back and releases it to number 7. He gets around his man. Can he finish now? He's going to approach the goalkeeper and he does. <laughs> Lovely bit of footwork. Coaxed his man out. Lovely finish. Brought his man out of position. Went around the other side. Collected it and dispatched it with his left foot sweetly into the bottom right-hand corner. That's 2-0 Elim United. And the NKFC boys must be losing some hope now. They've got a real uphill task if they're going to get this game back on track. So, a disappointing end to a fantastic day on the field for Gang Yu. But at the end of the tournament, his contribution to his team is acknowledged. He goes up on stage in front of hundreds of other players to collect the runners-up prize, a box of new boots. It seems as though Gang Yu has adapted and integrated successfully to life in South Korea. At first, he says it wasn't easy. My friends used to make fun of me and I felt uncomfortable. Gang Yu is not a celebrity and he's not getting the significant fees generated by TV appearances. But he is an important member of a football team, he's in education again, he's got a number of friends and a South Korean girlfriend. So how does he define his own identity today? In North Korea, everything is forced. In South Korea, I can do what I want. their own ways in South Korean society. Just outside of Seoul, we visit Yu Hunju, the lady in red, in her spacious apartment. She even brings out the accordion. Straight away, three things leap to my attention I can't imagine her having in an ordinary home in North Korea. She's got a giant television, a rice steamer... (laughs) ..and... A vibrating massage chair. As she cuts up vegetables for a North Korean fish soup, I wonder how she feels about defecting. The biggest gift I could give to my two children was to be born in South Korea. As time goes by, I feel more and more like a South Korean, but when I'm performing, I become a defector. You've been listening to North Korea's Celebrity Defectors with me, Jonathan Griffin. And me, Natalia Zor. Our thanks to Sarah Jackson, Kerryanna Embleton, Kevin Kim and Rory Madden. Our translator was Kim Jong-un. Seriously, I'm not winding you up. Mr O was behind the wheel, and our editor was Mike Wendling. Let me know what you thought about this programme. You can send me an email. It's jonathan.griffin at bbc.co.uk. Thanks for listening. And before you go, we'd like to mention another podcast about fascinating real-life stories. It's called Uncover, from our BBC World Service partners in Canada, CBC Podcasts. 
Its latest season goes back to the 1980s, when a bizarre phenomenon was sweeping North America. Rumours swirled about underground satanic cults terrorising children, forcing them to take part in gruesome rituals. Everyone, even the FBI, believed that children were under attack. But were they? Uncover looks at the ways fear and paranoia can twist our best intentions and lead to terrible injustice. Uncover Satanic Panic. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.